If you would take your Bibles with me, we're going to go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 25. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 25, we read this. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. I'm going to pause here briefly for a moment, because when you're reading this in Acts 16, Peter, or not Peter, but Paul and Silas did a miracle. There was a woman who was demon-possessed. She had been distressing them as they were ministering the Word of God. So Paul turned and he cast the demon out of her. And because he did that, because he did that, the people in that area rose up against them and demanded justice. So they put them into prison, chained them up. Now this is, this is incredible injustice. Paul and Silas did nothing wrong. They helped somebody. But here they are in prison. They have been beaten. They're in the inner prison. It's horrible. It's miserable. It's stinky. It's dark. And yet in this condition, they start singing praise to God. Church, there's so much of a lesson to be learned here in this moment. Because at their darkest point, they still praised the Lord. They still had faith in their hearts and in their minds to believe that God was going to make their bad situation into a good one. The Bible makes us this promise. God will take what the devil meant for our destruction, and he will use it for his glory. That's a promise from God in his holy word. And here, Paul and Silas are singing in prison. Look around us today. We're living in prophetic times even now. There's so many things going on all around us. And we see people from every corner of the globe dealing with fear and dread and all these, these emotions that are bubbling up to the surface. And we ask ourselves, what should we do? This is a good example right here. Lift up your head and rejoice because our faith is in Jesus Christ. He's not away from his throne. He's not off of his throne. He's not lost control. He's in control. We have reason to praise God. You look at Paul and Silas right here. They believed with all their hearts. God is going to do something. Well, what's he going to do? They're chained. They're chained to the wall at this point. They're in a prison, in the inner prison, guards outside the door. What's God going to do? Well, look at verse 2. Verse 2 states that an earthquake hit. Now, an earthquake will shake and rattle a lot of things. It can take buildings down. It can do a lot of horrible things. But what's amazing here is, number one, no one was hurt. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't say the prison collapsed. It said their chains fell off of them. How does an earthquake make chains fall off of a person? I've never heard of that happening. Did you ever hear of someone getting arrested, an earthquake shakes the ground, the handcuffs fall off of them? How does that happen? That's divine intervention. The Bible says an earthquake came, an angel came, the, the cuffs fell off of the prisoners, and the doors swung open. That's some powerful praise. That's some powerful praise. You know, this is something we miss. You look online, you see a lot of doom, doom, and doom, doom and gloom people talking. You hear a lot of naysayers talking. Let me tell you something. The prophecies that are coming to pass right before our eyes aren't meant to bring fear and worry on God's people. It's meant to be reassurance to say, hey, our faith is not misplaced. Our God really is God. And everything he says is happening is happening right now. And it's a time to remind us to look up our heads as Paul and Silas and rejoice and say, look what God is about to do. He's about to take his children home. But there is a point in all this where it is a gut check moment. Well, it's time to ask ourselves an important question. Am I living the way that I need to be living when God returns? Am I ready for him to return? That's a good question right there. 
I know in our family's home, and it's been this way since I was a kid with my parents, that my grandparents were this way. I think it's something we all do. But you're told, you said, someone is coming over to visit. My dad and I do the worst thing possible. We forget to warn our wives whenever we invite someone to the house. We do it often. Oh, honey, by the way, so-and-so's coming over in about an hour. Men, don't do that. I'm going to tell you right now, do not do that to your spouse. All of a sudden, everything goes into high gear. While I'm comfortable and I think, man, the house is ready, we're good. My wife is telling me, oh, no, no, we are not ready. There's a whole new level of ready that we get to when company's coming. So all of a sudden, what was good and clean to me is not good and clean to the person coming over. Apparently, their standard's really high. I've just been informed of this. So now we've got to get everything ready when they're coming over. Guess what happens? This is what happens when we see these signs coming to pass. Everyone gets nervous because someone's coming over and their standard of clean is not our standard of clean. We realize, man, i got to get ready. Paul and Silas, they're in prison right now. They're saying, it doesn't matter. Go ahead and chain us up. We're going to sing praises to God because he is able. And here an earthquake happens, chains fall off their hands, doors swing open, they're ready to walk out. But in that moment, listen to this in verse 27, the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Pause that for just a moment. That is amazing to me. Here he calls out to this man. This man's about to do himself harm. He says, do yourself no harm, we're all here. How did Paul know that? Look at what the prison guard did. It said the first thing he did upon hearing a voice was he ran and he got a light. It was dark, you couldn't see. But Paul knew in his heart, this is something the Lord showed him. He says, don't do yourself any harm, everybody's still here. And the man comes in, the Paul and Silas trembling. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Paul could say, oh, no, 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 hold up for a minute. That's what got me in here to begin with. No, 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 hold up. He could say, I'll talk to you about it later. Let me get to safety first. I really don't want to be in this prison. No, Paul's response is, God just showed me that he's able to get me out of here. I'm in no hurry whatsoever. Let's have a little talk about Jesus. He's the one that just sets the prisoners free. He's the one these chains m made fall off of me right here. He knocked these chains loose right here. He opened the door to my prison. Brother, I'm in no hurry. Do you got a couple of lawn chairs and some sweet tea? Because we're going to have a church meeting right here and now. I'm going to introduce you to Jesus in this dark prison. That's amazing to me. And everything Paul has gone through, being beaten and gone through all of this, he still says, I can't talk enough about Jesus. Let me tell you who he is and what he did for me. Church, if there was ever a time for us to be talking about Jesus, it's right now. If there was ever a time for us to get excited about our faith, it is right now. If there was ever a time to go knock on our neighbor's door and tell him, say, hey, let me tell you how good God is, now is the time to be doing it. Now's not the time to be digging a bunker. Now's not a time to be stocking our fridge with food. Now's the time to be getting the gospel in hand and go knocking on doors saying, you need to know Jesus today. Because in any moment at this point, a trumpet could sound, Christ can come, and we are out of here. We are out of here. I have heard so many people tell me over the last couple of weeks, telling me, oh, I dread the election. I don't because I may not be here. The trumpet could be sound and it could be somebody else's problem. I might be checking out and going home to be with the Lord. And I tell you what, I don't want anyone else to be here to have to deal with it either. Say, come with me. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me tell you about the goodness of God. 
say, oh, brother, they're going to hate you. They're not stronger than my Jesus. They're not greater than my God is. Church, it's time as Christians that we believe the Word of God that we've been holding in our hand for so long. The same Word of God that we learned as little children in Sunday school. It's time we believe the Jesus that we've been praying to every single day and know that our God is able. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. You look at Scripture. You look at all these terrible things that are going to happen. Listen to me. What does the Bible say about our response? The Bible says that God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What does 1 John tell us? It says that perfect love casts out fear. It casts it out. It sends it far away from us. God does not send a spirit of fear upon His people. He sends a sense of urgency to say, get ready. Now's the time to get ready. Now's the time to get your house in order. If there's something you've been holding on to that you've not been wanting to give it up, brother, sister, I'm telling you, now's the time to start giving it up because time is getting short. It's getting very short. We go further on in the Scripture. Here this man comes to, to Paul and Silas. He says, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 gives us the recipe. It says, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. Excuse me, you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Listen to what God did. This is, this is how much God loves you. I say this every week, but this is how much God loves you. And this is for all those watching on Facebook. This is for everyone watching anywhere they are. This is how much God loves you. Here Jesus sent out Paul and Silas. They healed a woman. Jesus, God allowed them to be beaten. He allowed them to be put in prison because the God of the universe saw a man in those prison doors that would never know him unless Paul and Silas were put in there. And while they were in there, Paul and Silas' faith grew. And God allowed for an earthquake to come. And this man who would have never heard the gospel to look at Paul and Silas Say, I want what you have. God allowed his servants to go through something that was hard to get to somebody otherwise they would have never gotten to. God sent his servants after the one. And that one said, what do I have to do to be saved? Church, that's how much God loves you. He reaches out to the darkest corner wherever you are and He puts somebody in your path to remind you how important you are to God. You say, Pastor, why doesn't God come back now? The prophecies are fulfilled. Why doesn't God come back now? Because there's still one more person He's reaching out to. There's still one more God is trying to get. And He'll wait. He'll wait as long as he can to get that one. He will wait because he loves you that much. He loves you that much. You're made in the image of God. Church, this is something we forget. We forget because we look at one another and we tend to go, I like you, I don't like you, I like you, I don't like you. You're harder than the others. And we kind of label everybody in that way. But God doesn't do that. What God does is He says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then He asks the question, do you love me in return? Do you love me in return? It's never a question of whether God loves you or not. It's a question of whether you love God. That's the question right there. And we're coming to the point that that's going to demand an answer. It's going to demand an answer of whether or not you love God. Look at this passage. When this man accepted Jesus as a Savior, he said, hey, I got people back at my home. At home! They need to hear too. And he brought 
Paul and Silas home. He washed their stripes. He cleaned them up. And they got to share the gospel of Jesus with everybody in their home. And notice it talks about even servants in his home. From the highest to the lowest at that time. God, God gave the gospel to all of them equally. The Bible says God does not show partiality. You may be the worst of sinners. You may be the best of people. There is no partiality with God. And he shares the truth with us. We go further in this story to Matthew 16. Go ahead and turn there with me. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 26. Matthew 16, verse 26. This is a powerful verse. I encourage you to mark it in your Bibles because it is just that important. It says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are important questions right there. Those are important. What's more important than eternity? You know, when you look at this passage right here, it's challenging us to say there's a lot of things that get in the way of our walk for God. A lot of things that seem more important than another at the time. Look in Adam and Eve. It's a perfect example. God told Adam and Eve, he said, you can eat of any tree you want, but don't touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You leave that tree alone. The Bible states that when Eve was looking at the fruit of that tree, she started analyzing it. It's desirable to make one wise. It's beautiful. It looks good to eat. She took of it. She gave it to her husband. He took of it. They were cursed. Now, think about this for a minute. When they disobeyed God, when they went and they pursued something that was opposite of him that looked good it cost them their eternity they they all of a sudden they're not going to live forever anymore there's a point where they're going to die they were kicked out of the presence of god and notice the first murder was one of their sons killing the other think about for a moment as adam and eve stood over the body of their son they had to know because we sinned in the garden, our son can't live forever. And God looked at that. He said, I don't want that. I don't want that. So he died on a cross for my sin, for your sin, that we could live forever. So we could have an eternity with God. And now you have this verse. And this verse is challenging us. What is there in this life that is more important than knowing where you stand in eternity. At the time, in the moment, I might say my ambition is to have a good job and to make lots of money. My ambition is to be the best at this. My ambition is to do X, Y, and Z. None of those things matter. Over the last several weeks, you've seen war snap up all of a sudden over in the Middle East. You've seen Israel be put under the gun by another nation. You've seen all these different things happen, and all of a sudden people are starting to think, what if Jesus really is coming back? And all of a sudden there's a lot of people getting anxious and worried because they realize there's nothing more important in this life than knowing where you stand with God. Adam and Eve at one point looked at something and thought, this is important, until they realized what it cost them. Then they wished they'd never done it. Now we're at a point in history where we're having to look again and ask ourselves the question, what's more important than knowing where you'll spend eternity? Here Paul and Silas are in prison, chained up. They've been beaten for their beliefs. And they sing praise to God anyway to say, this is more important. God, you're more important. My body's broken. I hurt all over. I'm chained to the wall. It's pitch black where I am. It's completely miserable. But I sing praises to you because you are who you say you are. And God just opens the prison door and man comes in. He says, he says, guys, I've never seen this before. The look on your face, the ability to sing when everything's falling down around you that your God would intervene on your behalf. Fellas, tell me who He is. I want to know who He is too. Man, that's powerful. 
You want to hear the greatest message about end time? Here it is. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the greatest message about the end times you're ever going to hear. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Look a little further as we go further in Scripture over to 1 Peter. You go on over to 1 Peter, and this is what it tells us in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to those verses right there. Though you have been tested for a little while. I remember my dad used to tell my mom all the time when he would get discouraged, mom would tell him. They'd look at each other in reference to me. they said, boy, if we could ever get him straightened out, God will do great things with him. This is what my parents used to say all the time. They used to say that all the time. I remember dad told me one day, he said, son, I want you to weed eat the yard. Go get the weed eater, weed eat the yard. Okay. So I go get the weed eater. It's out of gas. I put gas in it. I dribble a little gas on the floor. I got to looking at that, and I thought, you know, people always talk about gas is flammable. I wonder how flammable that stuff really is. So I moved the weed eater far over to the other side of the garage, and I grabbed the match. This is a little bitty spot, about the spot of a quarter. And I dropped that match on that flame, and it goes, whoo! All of a sudden, the weed eater goes, whoo! And I go, ah! Oh! And I go running to the other end of the yard to get water, and I'm getting water, and I'm pumping it out of the pump. We had one of those old-fashioned well pumps. You had to pump it out. So I'm pumping water out, trying to get it on, on that weed eater. I hear Lori yelling from the window, Dad, 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 the weed eater's on fire! The garage is on fire! Dad comes running out there. He smothers out the fire. I come running around the side of the house with my bucket of water, and there's my dad doing this. I wanted to tell Dad in that moment, say, Dad, remember, God's going to do great things with me. Don't kill me. I'm okay. It's hard to really think of that in the moment. It really is. You get tested. This is what 1 Peter tells us. You're going to go through some hard times not going to be easy you're going to be like paul and silas sometimes you're going to get whipped you're going to feel beaten you're going to be chained to the wall and you're going to sit back and you're going to wonder how is it all going to work where's god at in this moment and then all of a sudden you just resolve yourself to say i'm going to praise god anyway i know god is good And you start singing praise to God anyway. And when you do, you start realizing there's a plan in place. Paul and Silas realized when the earthquake hit and the doors flung open and the chains fell off, they realized there was a man there that needed to hear the gospel of Christ. He needed to hear that God loved him. And then in that moment, Paul and Silas say, let us tell you who Jesus is. Imagine this man. He's looking at Paul and Silas. They've been beaten. Scripture tells us that. They've got whelps all over their body. Their eyes might be black and blue from where they were hit. And yet in all this, this man's staring at him, and they're telling him, this is how good God is. And he's looking at him. This man saw something beyond the physical. He saw something inside of them that made him believe this is real. And they go back to their house. Paul and Silas lead an entire family, an entire household to Jesus Christ. Would never have happened if they had lost heart. In my life, I've done a lot of things. A lot of things where I've gotten discouraged. 
those around me have gotten discouraged, it never once ever meant that God did not have a plan in it all. Never once meant that. It meant we went through a hard spot, a hard time. If you look in 1 Peter again, it says your faith being much more precious than gold, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, it will be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The last part's the best. Whom you love. Whom you love. Church, I'm telling you, God has not given us a spirit of fear to run away from these things. He's given us a spirit of boldness to stand up and be counted. To say that our God is able to do what nobody else is able to do. Look in verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Eternity is something It's so hard to get our minds wrapped around what eternity is. What's really at stake in our walk for God. Let me put it for you this way. I heard a pastor once, John Hagee, was trying to explain eternity. And he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket. It was a silk handkerchief. And he said, eternity, to get a picture of eternity, it is this. If I were to stand on the top of Mount Everest with this silk handkerchief, and I were to run that silk handkerchief over the top of Mount Everest, when that mountain is nothing but a pile of dust, that's the beginning of eternity. Eternity has only just begun. That's how long it is. That's, what it, that's what's at stake in your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's eternity. Know where you stand with God today. Know where you stand. We're coming to an exciting time in history where we're about to meet our Savior and our God. Music can make your way on forward. This is, not, this is not a scary time in this sense. It's an exciting time. Imagine, imagine seeing Jesus in your eyes for the first time. Imagine seeing Him before you. The hands with the nail prints the side that was pierced, the feet that were pierced, the body that was broken, and he stands before me. The trumpet sounds, and I see him. And I see all the saints of old coming back with him. My family, my friends who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To see Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, Philip, I see all of them, all 12 disciples coming with Jesus in all of His glory. To see David, oh, to see David standing there in, in the presence of Jesus Christ. To see Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. To see all these people throughout history. To see Esther, Queen Esther, to see Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, to see them all before the throne of God. And the trumpet sounds and he says, come home. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. To, the, to, to see Jesus' face, what an amazing day that will be. To see all those people who've gone on before. And I get to be called home where there's no more death no sorrow, no pain, no suffering, no fear, no worry, no anxiety. It's all gone. All things are made new in the presence of God. I want to be ready. Oh my goodness, I want to be ready. That needs to be our prayer as believers today. We need to be Paul and Silas singing in the midst of our pain. To be rejoicing in moments of weakness and trial. In 
hands and say, Lord, I'm ready. I spent all my life, every breath, to be ready. I'm ready to see you. Not because I'm good, but because I believe. Father, for everything you've shown me, everything that's not of you, I've laid it down. And I'm ready to be in your presence. Church, that needs to be our prayer. I tell you what, we can say all day how good we are. It's filthy before God. Whatever good we've done is filthy before Him. It's time we get right with our Savior. And you may sit back today, you may be saying this to yourself and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready. You know, I say that to my wife all the time. I invite somebody over to the house. We're ready, honey. We're ready. As she's running through the house, she's showing me all these things where we're not. I missed it. Man, I thought I was ready. But the more she showed me, the more I realized I'm not even close. That's how our walk for God is so often. We get comfortable and we say, I'm ready. In reality, church, so often of the time, we're just not even close. We need a closer walk today. Don't be scared over the things that you see. Take them as a warning from the Lord to say, I'm coming. Be sure, be sure that you're ready when I come. Whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart today, if you're someone that you're just saying, Pastor, I need to be certain. Eternity is too important. I need to be certain. Then come forward today and take the time to be certain where you stand with God. If you're someone that you just say, Pastor, I've never made that decision. I've never asked Jesus to be my personal Lord and Savior. And I need to make that decision. I'm telling you what, you are important to the Lord. You are precious to Him. Call out on His name and believe in your heart. He will answer you. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, I invite you to this altar for any need you have, for any prayer you need to pray, I invite you this morning.